1968 was a time in which the entire planet was feeling the reverberations of a new, a new spirit. It certainly, it was going on in Mexico. It was going on in France. It was going on all over the United States with students of every single state and college and town demanding that there was and had to be a better alternative to what was going on in the world at that time. The Vietnam War was a big issue for everybody, particularly for Chicanos, because we were dying there in higher proportions to anyone else. And no one was acknowledging that. So that our contributions didn't mean anything to the country. And we saw reflected in the world that people thought that something could be done. And we felt that we had to do what we could do with our lives as well. That was the time in 1968. There was never a school term like this one. It began with a simple protest by students who wanted a better education. School officials became involved, and the parents, then the police, and the FBI. Before long, school children were branded as subversives, their lives threatened, all because they wanted a better education. Los Angeles. In the 1960s, this was home to almost 100,000 Mexican Americans. It was the largest barrio in the United States. Growing up in East Los Angeles, I wasn't actually aware of it as a, as a young child, but it, it soon became apparent that uh, I grew up in a very isolated, very segregated neighborhood a community that was totally separate from the rest of Los Angeles. Education was seen as a way to break down those barriers. A way for young people to one day have what everyone else had. Well, I was buying into this whole thing about the American dream. Get an education, you can be whatever you want to be, and and uh, you know, read all these books and listen to the teachers, even though at the back of my mind I'm saying something's going on here, you know, I, the, the reality that I see here is different from what you're saying. Something was definitely wrong. Only one out of four Chicanos completed high school. The dropout rate was really kind of what some people called a push-out rate. I mean, these were students who were being pushed out of school because uh, their needs weren't being met, their culture was not addressed. The school really wasn't doing anything for them. Unemployment was almost double the national average. Those who worked earned about two-thirds of what other Los Angeles residents earned. These conditions had a dramatic impact on Mexican-American children. I 
started elementary school in the uh, early 1950s, and I was uh, the only student in my uh, kindergarten class that was a monolingual Spanish-speaking child. And uh, I was immediately led to the front of the class, and uh, I was instructed on how to uh, create a cone hat out of uh, construction paper. Uh, the teacher painted a word on it and told me I could take it off when I learned to speak English, and the word she had painted on that was the word Spanish. I remember going to elementary school taking my tacos of uh, frijoles and meat and rice and being made fun of by the other kids, in, in, in junior high especially, to the point where I didn't want to take tacos de carne to school. I wanted to take bologna sandwiches. I remember feeling ashamed, you know, when my father would go to school because he didn't speak good English and translating for him feeling ashamed of being Mexican, and which fed this growing anger in me. And I think those same things were, you know, infecting everyone else, and everyone responded in a different way. The burden was pretty heavy, you know, in terms of the shame of not feeling that your parents were worth anything, because the teachers and the schools treated them like children. There were clear signs of prejudice and discrimination. I remember vividly when I was an honor student being asked by the white counselor what my father did for a living and me telling her, well, you know, uh, he's a laborer, you know, uh, he works with his hands. And then she told me, and I'll never forget this, these were the exact words, that is a very honorable profession. You should follow in your father's footsteps. My homemaking teacher, she would say, you know, you little Mexicans, you better learn and pay attention. This class is very important because, you know, uh, most of you are going to be cooking and cleaning for other people. It was real clear to me that there was a definite tracking system. Some students went into um, the academia tracking and were, were, were being prepared to go to college. Others were being tracked into going into the shop classes, into the vocational areas. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with, with that, but you didn't have a choice. You were tracked into those areas. Students were grouped into the classes, generally based on uh, some kind of ability rating. Usually it was IQ. The lower groups didn't get the same benefits and also didn't get the same support for uh, going to college. Gradually, these students realized they were not alone in their frustrations. I heard that there were many more students who had the same kind of yearning and anger and desire to do something with their lives and not be stereotyped and uh, pegged into uh, being some sort of commodity for labor. A lot of us had the same sort of complaints about what was happening in our lives as far as our education. So we decided to take a survey. That's when we start to gather that information and start interacting with the school district saying, you're not meeting our needs. And look at, uh, you know, people are saying they don't get college advisements. Uh, kids are saying that they get pushed out of school, that discipline is not fair. They went from better food all the way to, you know, we want to go to college. We have the lowest reading rate in East LA, in the, in the East Side schools. We have graduates that graduate from high school, that graduate, that are in the 12th grade, that graduate and are out to face the world and can only read an uh, eighth and a ninth grade reading level. And we believe this is a crisis. Uh, we were just being passed we because of our age and nothing else. So they really didn't care if we learned how to read or we knew how to spell or anything else like that. It was just a matter of, you know, okay, just go. I think the bottom line is the lack of concern of the teachers towards the kids and whether the kids were really getting an education or not. Uh, the reality set in that uh, teachers weren't really concerned for the kids. Students called for bilingual instruction, Mexican-American history courses, an end to corporal punishment, and the hiring of more Mexican-American teachers and counselors. 
Their efforts transformed America's understanding of what was meant by civil rights. They presented their demands to the Los Angeles School Board. They felt like we were not counseling them, but we're trying to have them go into industrial arts. Well, that wasn't true at all. We were trying our best to get as many to go on to a four-year school as would. What can we do when we do not have the actual authority to control what the whole of society is doing? If we could distribute everybody equally and have equal funds everywhere and have equal quality of teachers, there would be no problem. They patted us on the back, and my recollection was is that they literally just threw away the results of our survey. And that began to politicize us. The students were facing a problem that had for years caused concern within their community. As early as the turn of the century, Mexican-American families called for educational reform. They protested the segregation of their children in so-called Mexican schools, where teachers severely punished Mexican-American students for speaking Spanish in the classroom. Keep in mind that the Spanish language for many Mexicans is almost a characteristic of being Mexican. It's a defining characteristic, not an incidental characteristic. Young children were taught that the culture of their community, of their parents, was really a hindrance to success. If a child learned these kinds of things, he began then to look upon his cultural background upon his parents, upon his community in a negative way. So you treat them and you teach them at the lowest common denominator of labor and how to use your hands. And you get them out into the fields and into jobs as quickly as possible. That was the Mexican experience in schools. By 1946, parents in Santa Ana, California were fed up. They filed suit against local school officials and won. Mendes versus the Westminster School District declared the segregation of Mexican-American children to be unlawful. It set the stage for the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision Brown versus Board of Education, which declared segregated schools unconstitutional throughout the United States. Despite this ruling, segregated schools remained. And even in integrated settings, Mexican-American students still suffered from neglect and unequal resources. The end result of this is that the uh, Mexican children were given an inferior education, which prepared them for menial kinds of positions and jobs as cheap laborers, the kinds of positions that their parents filled. Our greatest resource is the skill and the vision and the wisdom of our people. If your education falters or fails, everything else that we attempt as a nation will fail. If you succeed, America will succeed. Over half of all the Mexican-American children have less than eight years of school. How long can we pay that price? There's a vast ignorance about the Mexican, and consequently there's a, there's a myth that the Mexican is pliable, he is non-resistant, and that anybody can do anything to him that anybody wishes. Well, this isn't true. But now that he's become an urban Mexican, and now that there's a more numerous generation of... Uh, Dr. Mexican Ernesto Galarza, a longtime labor activist and educator, college. sensed that traditional uh, perceptions so of the Mexican-American community were about to be challenged. Uh, the tensions within the Mexican community are increasing, and they show themselves in the current protest movements. Despite the earlier efforts to improve education, a half century of frustration was about to explode in the East Los Angeles schools. This was a time in which enough Chicano students had gained mastery of the tools that were necessary to shake up the system, and had taken the ideals of the country to heart and so uh, we protested for our rights. 
It was the political evolution of a group of young Chicanos in East L.A. From being involved in community civic-minded activities as young citizens for community action, and then becoming culturally aware of their background, their history, their race, and becoming young Chicanos for community action, and asserting their real identity, and then getting involved and realizing that the system wouldn't change unless you became more, more direct action. During that time, we were building support. We were all talking to other students at campuses. We were talking to teachers. People were talking to their parents. Um, and we were building support in the community. I was a first year graduate student. And I was involved in the initial organizing of UMAS, which stands for the United Mexican American Students. And uh, we had begun to talk with other leaders in the area at other campuses that we needed to commit ourselves as college students uh, to the betterment of our uh, community, and in particular to changing things for the betterment of our sisters and brothers in the high schools, for example, in the elementary schools. Sal Castro, an outspoken history teacher, helped to organize the students. For years, the schools have wrapped for blaming the, the Mexican home for not doing a good job in educating the kid. In other words, if the kid doesn't go to school, it's a Mexican parent's fault or it's a Mexican home's fault. Well, I've yet to see a Mexican kid come into school at the age of five or six years of age not knowing a language. Castro grew up in East Los Angeles, where he learned firsthand the problems within these he schools. Is, he has learning readiness, or he's, he's ready to learn when he walks in the school. So it's not the fault. It's never, it has never been the fault of the Mexican home. His activism was shaped by vivid memories from his youth. In the 1930s, Sal's father was deported to Mexico, part of a U.S. repatriation program provoked by the Great Depression. In the 1940s, he witnessed the Zoot Suit riots when U.S. soldiers and sailors attacked Mexican-Americans in the streets of Los Angeles. By the spring of 1968, Sal Castro knew clearly what he was up against. Most teachers approach the Mexican as with a negative attitude and that you have nothing to give to me. I am going to make you an Anglo come hell or high water and whatever you have to say about it makes no difference. We had to now say the schools are not working. They're taking our taxpayers' money, the hard money that our fathers and mothers work for and not returning in any way. We're the only ones losing out. A massive walkout to shut down the schools was what we somehow decided on. Change wasn't going to come from within, it had to come from without. How many people were going to do it and who was going to do it was, I think, decided that morning for, for a lot of us, me included. And at 9 a.m., while we were all sitting in class, everyone was aware this was going to happen. The signal was going to be, blow out, <laughs> blow out. And so we went around the school and said, hey, blow out, blow out. So then all of a sudden, kids began to come out of those classes, and the teachers said, what was going on? My friends would go down the, uh, the hallway saying, walk out, walk out. And I remember looking at them and thinking, my God, am I really going to do this? Hey, and then all of a sudden, the chanting began, Chicano power, Chicano power, ya basta, we demand change. In the morning as I, I walked into the school, as the bell rang for the kids to go to school, into the classroom, out they went. Kids from all over, different hallways and everything else, bam, out in the streets, with, with their heads held high, with dignity, 
It was beautiful to be at Chicago that day. students walked out of five Eastside high schools that day. By the end of the week, 16 schools were affected with more than 10,000 students out in the streets. Reaction in the community was mixed. Not everyone supported the blowouts. The majority of the students at Garfield High School do not, do not condone or accept the method which has been used. For me, it was kind of a, a sad time. I felt embarrassed about the way people were acting, and it felt uncomfortable uh, to watch people acting uh, rudely, loudly, uh, treating people with disrespect. School officials blamed outsiders, singling out a group of young militants called the Brown Berets. Some people seem to feel that it's the Brown Berets who are running this show and getting everybody out. Uh, do you agree with that, or who's responsible for what's happening? Is it the Brown Berets, or...? It's the Garfield High School Strike Committee. Who organized this? We organized this, the Garfield High School Strike Committee. How'd you get the uh, idea? We just saw that the school was bad. The Brown Beret organization became involved as we were fearful that the police, you know, were going to come down heavy. Uh, on these kids, and we wanted to protect them as much as possible. So the Brown Berets represented the security. The Brown Berets were a paramilitary group. They advocated direct action and were often confrontational. As such, they became a source of great concern for the police and the local press. The Brown Berets are a group of uh, young Chicano students in college. And we've uh, finally uh, gotten together and are aware that the Chicano, the mixed American, and the black man is not benefiting from this great American society. Uh, little by little... Uh, the newspaper, the local East L.A. Tribune, Tribune, started accusing the Brown Berets of being outside agitated troublemakers. We would tell everybody that, look at what they're writing about us. You know who we are. We live here. We grew up here. You know, and we're still here. And if the Mexican-American students want to lead this protest, a protest which we, unfortunately, have not had the courage as adults to lead in the past, then we will back and support the Mexican-American students in, in their efforts. The administrators are saying that we're disrupting the educational process. That's not so. The educational process of Mexican-Americans for over 20 years in East Los Angeles and throughout the Southwest has been disrupted right. by its failure to communicate with the Mexican-American. That is the disruption when 57% of the students at Garfield drop out around. year after year. There has to be a problem. We're not operating in a vacuum. There's social injustice. They needed to be jolted and shocked. And it's what happened. I think the, the establishment, the status quo, was surprised that all these little Mexican kids would be blowing out and walking out and protesting. What could the community have done? Did they have a legitimate complaint? Absolutely. Did they bring that complaint to public attention in the only way they could have? Probably. But were they right on everything? No. Striking students gathered at a local park and demanded a meeting with school board members. I cannot compel the Board of Education to come. My feeling is All right. that, you can. That, I, I... That, that members of the Board of Education will be happy to come and talk with you. May I respond to that? Now, what I've said to you is that I realize your limitations, but I'm also saying that we, the students, are demanding that they come. We are only asking you to relay this information. And I remember the Aryan superintendent tried to talk to us, but he didn't have anything to say. What could he say to us? And so there were, the students got up there and spoke, and uh, there was this tremendous energy and fervor. There was an excitement that we actually pulled it off. 
Despite opposition, walkout leaders from Eastside schools forged a united front. And we're supposed to have a meeting with the school board, and they picked down on us. But what they're trying to do is split us up, and we don't want us to split us up, do we? My decision to walk out was probably the lightest decision in terms of what I probably would have liked to have done at that point with that kind of uh, youth and energy and anger. That's why we're not going to be here like separate schools. We're all united in Chicago, right? The walkouts continue. Tensions increased. Get the police in the mouth. Could we please, could we please have a quiet? Now listen. The assembly will stop until the police leave. We are having a peaceful demonstration. We, will, we do not need police officers at this place. The policemen, if they are here, uh, should leave the area. I think that we can take care of things ourselves. That Community leaders and school board members tried to calm the situation. To the extent that you dramatize the problem, you help me. To the extent that you convince the public that you will demand at all costs your handicap me. Consider that. I was aware that there was frustration within the minority community. I was aware that there was great political opposition within the majority community. And so I knew that, in a sense, we were sitting on a tender box. Now, I want to tell you once again, we're asking for immediate action. And that, I, I hate, we, I really hate to do this again, but we would just have to walk out once more. I command you to leave the people of the state of California to disperse immediately. Two minutes. Problems began to escalate. Police were called in to maintain order. The police were not our friends back then. They were there to keep us down. And certainly the authorities of the time felt that we were just crazy, you know, that the Mexicans were getting out of control. Start moving from here. Get all the dollars to the point of the porque ahorita va a ir un pedo la fregada. So everybody starts splitting, man. I mean it, man. They're going to start picking them in the buses. The unlawful order assembly included the stands inside the football field. Anyone on the stands will be arrested. Following the uh, Watts riot in 1965, uh, law enforcement began to undergo uh, what we call the DART training, disaster and riot training, uh, recognizing that uh, we may be facing a period of unrest. I'd be less than truthful if, if I sat here and said that we always do everything perfectly and, and never uh, overreact. There, there are occasions when individuals do overreact. The only thing that happened was that one of the gates on that Wednesday afternoon, they couldn't get out the gate. And, and one of the, of all things, the quarterback on the football team tried to break the lock. And the police arrested him. And I said, you can't, you know, we need him now. Just take it easy. He's the quarterback. I felt two arms on each side of my body, grabbed me underneath my arms, pulled me away off from the main uh, line of students. They assumed I was an outsider from the school. People were just running in the streets, just clubbing people. I mean, the police were just clubbing the people in the streets and running after them. And some of them were just sitting on the lawns there. First to see such resistance, and then to see outright hostility, brutality, it didn't match the, the, the thing that we were doing. We didn't commit a crime. We were protesting. 
I thought they had uh, overreacted somewhat, and that might have been because I don't think they had had such a thing before in their career of confronting two or three hundred high school students uh, determined to cross the street. That's what it amounted to. I think what people saw was that even when kids were involved in constitutionally protected activity, such as legitimate protest, such as the walkouts were, and yet they were abused and jailed. Police were not kind to high school students. They treated them in the same way that they treated other Mexicans, and that was not very good. So the parents were concerned that somebody would get hurt. We knew what the danger was. We could see it. But we also couldn't stop it. They were already there. They were doing it themselves. So it just spurred us on to get these reforms going so that it would cool off. We got to stay together and not, not have violence. School authorities began to pressure the striking students. The kids are getting now getting calls from, from principals that they're going to be suspended, that they're going to be expelled, that anybody that was headed for college and had grants or scholarships, the scholarships were to be taken away. We need it. We need it. Some, some public official to say the kids are right. We all went to go meet Bobby Kennedy on the day he was about to go meet Cesar Chavez, who was undergoing his fast at the point, to request that he support our efforts, in which he did, in which he was very, um, I guess, generous with his words and very offered us positive support. He knew all about the walkouts. He had had a list of our demands. He asked us a couple of questions, and he told us that he supported everything that we did. We are not going to play games. Parents concerned for their children's future became actively involved. We are not going to allow this situation to continue. We are not going to let young people below the age of 18 do the work that belongs to us. As their children had done, they asked to meet with school officials. Their request was denied. It seems that our voices are not heard. What else have they left for us to do? All we can do is support them. We spent three weeks trying to find one educator to understand the meaning of lack of respect. El respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. It's a real place where our movement was going to definitely demonstrate its full potential and strength was here in the city. For the first time, what was more significant is not what individuals were doing, but what masses of people were doing. And that's what the walkouts demonstrated. Our movement was not a movement of, of, of cadres, of individuals, of organizations, but of mass involvement. Of men and women of the Mexican-American community. Three weeks later, the school board bowed to pressure and agreed to meet with parents. We have allowed our young people to get the short end of the stick for too long. The students returned to school hoping things would work out. Parents and teachers from East L.A. began meeting regularly with the school board to implement the students' demands. The students had not only taught their parents about education, they'd also expanded the concept of what civil rights meant in America. By early June, things seemed back to normal. Two thirty in the morning, banging at the door, bang, bang, bang. And I go to the door, bang, the door comes down. Uh, the LAPD, sheriffs, county sheriffs, with their weapons drawn, come right in, with their weapons pointed at my head. He grabbed me, threw me into a car, pulled his gun, handcuffed me. And I asked, what am I being arrested for? And they wouldn't tell me. You know. So the next thing I knew, I was downtown in the glass house. They put the cuffs on me and they said, you know, we're going to take him off. They took him off again and we're going to give you 10 
steps that you can make a run for it. I knew what they wanted to do. And I said, ah, cabron, I said to myself, this is really serious business, you know. And I was scared for my life. And I, walk, all I can remember thinking about my children, you know, my two children, what's going to happen to them after they kill me? And I put my hands back again. You better cuff me and take me in. Thirteen Chicano leaders involved in the walkouts were arrested and indicted on conspiracy charges. One of them was Sal Castro. If convicted, each defendant faced 66 years in prison. You know, in reality, it's not us that are indicted. It's not us that are up for conspiracy. Because in the long run, the indictment will be on the Board of Education. The convictions will be on the individual members of the Board of Education, principals, vice principals, and counselors who've been completely negligent of their jobs for years and years and years. And it's not only an indictment of the Los Angeles schools, but of all the schools in the Southwest, where Chicanos have gone to for years, and where the schools have failed miserably in teaching them, they will be indicted, and they will be convicted. And in the long run, our kids will win. The Mexican will win. The United States will win. All of us ganaremos. Gracias. When we were told what we were arrested for, we were shocked. Because in particular, they created a felony indictment. Disrupting a public school was only a misdemeanor. But the conspiracy to commit a misdemeanor was a felony. The East I-13 was the first political trial in the Chicano movement. All of a sudden now, we had a real problem on our hand, and we had some very, very good, dedicated people that were going to be given a terrible time in the courts and possibly a criminal record for trying to make the city and the state do its job better. I think that the community recognized that that arrest was designed to stop this movement. And so we knew that we had to come to their defense. It was just an, another thing they were throwing at us that we had to surmount. The reason for the interest of the American Civil Liberties Union in this case is that the indictment charges no more than acts of urging others, for instance, to engage in a boycott of the schools. And in our view, such urging is fully protected by the First Amendment and the prosecution violates the Constitution. The entire conduct of these proceedings has been a political harassment. It's an, uh, it's an outright political attack on the entire Mexican-American community, directly and indirectly on, uh, on all of the rest of us, because our civil rights are involved, too. The demonstration is a poor man's printing press, and uh, his right to use it has got to be as inviolate as the rich man's right to print his newspaper, or, or else our talk about free speech is just a mockery. Police harassment or harassment is not new to the bound parade. It seems that Chief Redden and the Los Angeles Police Department have mistook community sentiment. The LA-13 were released on bail on Monday, June 3rd, 1968. But their release was overshadowed by the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy two days later. The Chicano movement was suddenly on the defensive against the police and even the FBI. The day that we were at Lincoln High School, for the first blowout, there were guys with suits on, with cameras, taking our pictures. It was part of, I learned later on, part of the FBI counterintelligence program, or COINTELPRO, that had been created to deal with the civil rights movement and the black power movement. And documents that I got also showed the infiltration of UMAS and Chicano student organizations. It changed the political landscape of the movement. 
and it changed my life because instead of pushing for social justice, we had to completely reverse into defending ourselves so that the political struggle became a struggle to keep some of its own leadership out of jail. And I remember, you know, just beginning to have this sense that I was being watched. And people started talking about it. We started talking about uh, provocateurs and infiltrators. And certainly after these arrests, everyone was paranoid. The Brown Berets were a special target. The LAPD at that time was doing surveillance or taking a lot of photographs. We didn't realize this till way later on when we were arrested. We felt it was an attempt to try to uh, stop the movement, the growing movement. And uh, little did we know that the Berets by then had already been infiltrated by the sheriffs and the LAPD. One of the walkout leaders who said he was from Wilson High School turned out to be an LAPD. Everyone was suspect. And with good reason, it turned out that a significant number of the people in uh, these various organizations were police officers or informants. Many of them were actually the people who were proposing violent actions. The officials were keeping tabs on certain individuals uh, which were then uh, being referred to the FBI on subversive activities in which I was one of those people who was listed as a, one of the hundred most subversive individuals in the United States in 1970. What I started to see was a series of, of arrests and, and threats uh, against me personally and other berets. You know, you guys are troublemakers, you're making our people look bad, and we, you know, we're going to be sure that you spend the rest of your, of your life in prison or you end up dead. And I began to get these documents as the years went on in doing my research, and sure enough, I got a bunch of documents on myself. And then, I, and then I realized why it was that that night that I was arrested, that early morning that I was arrested, why I was almost killed. Because in those documents, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover himself, had identified me and the rest of us, you know, conspirators and protesters, as subversives, dangerous, armed subversives. You know, and my God, all we were doing was nonviolent protest. As schools opened in the fall, the East L.A. 13 felt the full impact of their indictments. I walked in this morning and they told me I could not teach, that I would have to go downtown to personnel, that I could not teach. Who told you? Uh, uh, the principal. There was a ruling, part of the education code, that if you are arrested, you cannot be in the classroom. Uh, and then because I was indicted, I was an indicted felon, for sure I could not be out in the, in the classroom. So I was going to have problems as far as teaching. The struggle in the East Los Angeles school system came down to a single defining moment. Students and parents fought to get Sal Castro reinstated. This was a person who put himself out on the line, and his community came to his support. And at that point, whether you liked him or you didn't like him wasn't even the issue. The issue was is that this community, the Chicano community in Los Angeles, had to have a role in what the schools did. What do you think it will take to get people to pay attention to the demands of the Mexican-American community? Well, you know, that's a good question. Actually, uh, in, in looking uh, in retrospect, there were about 15,000 kids out in the streets uh, in that week of March, uh, there were about 16 schools involved, not only uh, senior highs throughout uh, East Los Angeles, but also in West Los Angeles, in support of the kids in East LA. There were junior high schools involved. There were about uh, 45 high school students arrested. There were about 25 adults. And, you know, the majority community seemed like un uh, was unconcerned, uh, business as usual. We picketed that high school every day with a contingent of people picketing to call for Sal Castro to be returned to Lincoln. And in between our daily pickets at Lincoln, we also went to the school board meetings, which were on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons, to address them and ask them to return Sal to Lincoln. It was Zapata, Zapata who said, 
I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees. In front of Lincoln High last week, the crippled and the blind paraded so that you might have eyes to see and courage to stand on your feet and to deal in good faith with the Mexican-American community. After 10 days of picketing without results, Chicano activists resorted to a new tactic. Instead of walking out, they sat in. And we said, well, we're not going to leave. And we'll sit here and we'll stay here until you make the decision that our needs of the Chicano community in this city are taken care of. And the community has the right to make decisions about the kinds of people who teach in their schools. It just seemed like the next logical step, you know, that we had to, to kind of uh, apply a little bit more pressure. We were determined to occupy that room, and that was our main, our main function. We, we slept there. Uh, we kept that room occupied uh, through that whole period. I'd never done anything like that before. And it was civil disobedience. And civil disobedience means that you have to take the consequences. So we knew what the stakes were. But we knew we had to do it. At one point, they turned off the air conditioning. At one point, they turned off the phones. At one point, they turned off the heat. And they did all these interesting things to make us uncomfortable. But there were things you read, a lot of books. We sang. <laughs> we had mass. Uh, it, was, um, it was a time to talk about what we were going to do next. And every day, you know, we thought it was going to end every day. We thought, OK, it'll be over. They're going to listen. Our people want the, the school system to respect the integrity, to have respect for the dignity of the person, regardless of his cultural background and regardless of his economic power. Uh, we live in a society that respects money. And we in the Mexican community are insisting that, that the schools learn to respect people. I still have a very vivid memory of the people sitting on the floor as I walked to my office. I wish I could have had them come into my office or come into the board and executive session and see all of the problems. Then they would understand that we didn't want to do to them what they thought we were doing to them. After seven days, the board agreed to vote on Sal Castro's reinstatement. But they demanded that protesters end the sit-in or be arrested. That last night, the officers came in and made the announcement that they were going to begin arrests. And, and those of us who didn't want to be arrested had to leave. 35 demonstrators refused to leave. You are hereby notified that this building will be closed at 10 o'clock p.m. That any permission, implied or otherwise, to remain on these premises is hereby revoked. You will be considered trespassing and in violation of California Penal Code, Section 602N. It was clear to us that we did not have the power and that they could crush us if they decided to, as certainly they had crushed many other movements. The next day, as the board prepared to vote, Chicano leaders made a final appeal. It's not so much, Mr. Castro. It's the issue, what the man means to every teacher. Academic freedom, shall we call it, to a Negro, to a Mexican, to an Anglo, shall we say. We are here to express to you that in accepting a Mexican teacher who says that it's good to be Mexican, 
you're also accepting a principle that may govern our city without barbed wire in the middle of the street. For out of one flesh has God made, has God made all men. The Los Angeles School Board began to vote as the community watched. Roll call, please. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Dr. Harder? Yes. Dr. Nala? Yes. Dr. Rich? Yes. Dr. Watt? No. Reverend Jones? Yes. I move the adjourn. <laughs> Are you a troublemaker, or a rabble rouser, and everything else? Are you that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm a reformer in education. What does that mean? Uh, there are many changes that have to be made because at this point, education is not relevant to kids in general and Mexicans in particular. Sal Castro and the other LA 13 defendants won their battle with the school district, but they still face the possibility of long prison terms. Their legal battles would continue for two more years. The East LA 13, which was of course the case coming out of the walkouts, was ultimately thrown out of court on appeal, again based on the Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to petition the government for redress of grievances. The walkouts were the first significant urban struggle of the Chicanos. And all that our kids were trying to do was to make the schools work better. What the walkouts did, it, it focused the attention now on the Chicanos in the city because these kids were serious. These kids that went to school from that time, they were going to do something. They were going to change the world. Los Angeles was only the beginning. Soon after the blowouts, Chicano students across the country staged similar protests, igniting a movement for educational reform that would continue for many years to come. We were very successful at informing the public about how serious the conditions were. Also in getting our parents and other community people involved. The blowouts made us all realize that, well, collectively, we had a strong voice, and it gave us a power that we didn't realize that we had before, and we knew that we were going to win, you know, one way or another. <laughs> 